That door, could we lock that door, please? I'm sitting between you guys in the bar. Thanks for seeing it through. Real, yeah, real privilege to be here. It's nice to be back in front of everyone after a couple of crazy years. And how exciting is that? What well, Fiona's talking about. Um, I like this idea of get to the point of glasses and you know maybe even audio stimulus to say you know when you when you've locked on that's when you pick and yeah, perhaps our mind is our limitation of what we could do. Um, you could be forgiven for thinking that perhaps the ag tech space is in the last couple of years has been pretty a pretty wild ride and in a lot of cases during COVID the, the money stopped flowing to a lot of um, to a lot of businesses and a lot of parts of the world but um, to the uh, to the contrary it was not the case for ag tech and I just want to have a quick quick whip around here on the sort of the, the ecosystem uh, that's the first of many buzzwords uh, for the presentation and to give you a feel for where the money's flowing and the reason it's important in the conversation is what we're seeing with most technologies where the money flows we see the, the pace or the, the cadence of that improvement in technology go up uh, quite sort of linear and with it. And so where the money flows is often where we see the advancements. Um, in the last five, six, seven years that I've been looking at ag tech, it's interesting, it sort of shifted from, it was really just ag tech, hardware, software, very farm centric. In the last two years, it's agri-food tech and that's really stretched its lens. Uh, and I think the, the pull through the food delivery system, how that impacts agriculture, the tech, the way it links together, provenance, traceability, you can see how it's stretched right down. And there's some not insignificant um, deals that were done there. I mean, a $3 billion deal that was done uh, there last year in an e-grocery um, ag tech deal and up 85% from previous years. So, so really good signs. Um, and your sector was not, um, did not miss out. So some really interesting deals with a similar trend that you'll see um, in this space. So uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it actually. So Oishi had a, a really um, interesting raise of uh, significant amount of money for a, for a novel cultivation method of, of strawberries in the vertical farming space. So they took a, a share of that wallet that was um, that I talked about before in that uh, that big big three um, three billion dollar deal. Um, you know this one's pretty well documented. Um, the, the Driscoll's plenty relationship continues to evolve. They've participated in several rounds and and that collaboration is, is in the vertical farming space. And yeah, it's, uh, I think a lot of us are interested to see where that journey goes. And you know, an adjacent technology deal that was done was actually um, one of Plenty's competitors in Bowery Farming who um, jumped into bed with a, uh, a vision and robotics harvesting um, business to further bring automation and, and gains into their, their harvest processes there. So um, really interesting and you know, three deals all in that vertical farming space, that's telling us something. Um, and for what it's worth, many other cropping sectors, you know, aren't part of these style of deals. So it's interesting that your, your area is still gaining attention. So, it's all good, right? The money's flowing, the tech companies are out there, they're multiplying, tons of solutions, you've got them all on your farms, yeah, it's all, it's all good, right? Um, it's not quite the case, and there's a reason why. Um, you know, any of these things sound familiar to you when you're thinking about a technology or a technology company? You know, oh, it's just, it's no good. It, they just don't understand our system, you know. It doesn't work like that here. You can't, you know, we grow differently, you know. Or, um, you know, the problem is it can only do half the job. I love that one. Absolutely love it. You know, you talk to people that can't find enough labour, tell me the labour's too dear, and they, got a real, they get their nose out of joint because this particular machine can only harvest half the crop. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I think, but it's, this is real. These are problems and this is how we assess things when we see technology. Um, and people sit there, oh, have you ever tried to use it? It's so slow. You know, oh, it, just, it just doesn't do what I want it to do. Or, um, you know, it's this sort of rhetoric. You get the idea. You know, it should be able to do that. It can't be that too hard. Like, I love that one. I'm not sure if Fiona's still in the room, but she must hear that all the time. Oh, while you're there, can you also collect this data and can you spit out the, the bad ones and can you count... It can't be that hard, can it? You know, so and that's often what we say when we don't understand things because it can't be that hard. So everyone's right if they're thinking in this way, um, but I have, yeah, I have a discussion point today. Is we could do a whole presentation on where I think perhaps technology companies could maybe come and meet us halfway, but we have less control over that, and that's why I want to talk about perhaps what we could do. So which one are you? So those that know me, I'm I'm over here. This is. This is me over on the, on the left. I'm normally pretty glass half full. I think we can find a way through it. And I think we've got to pick ourselves up a little bit and just stop looking. If we're so motivated to solve these big problems 
and that we talk about the impact they'll have on our business if we solve them like robotic harvest, et cetera, and the size of the prize is big, well then, you know, I think we can do more. I think we've got to get a wriggle on and, and look at what we can do to meet halfway. And I want you to think as I talk on this next slide, which we'll probably spend most of the time on, and think about technology you're assessing or problems or unmet needs you're looking at, and are you doing all that you can do to bridge that gap and there's an intersection in the middle. So this is sort of my view on how we can become a little bit more technology ready. Now you've already heard from Fiona, all roads, you know, not surprisingly lead to data and um, it's no different in our business. Obviously I work for Costa Group, I work in across many different crops, but if we're not collecting robust, reliable, meaningful data sets, it becomes really challenging on several fronts. So it means actually sitting there and penciling out return on invest or why do I fix that problem before I fix that problem, it becomes really, really challenging. In addition to that, until you've got deep, long data sets, you can't, there's actually quite a bit of technology you can't use right now. Um, I'll give you a quick example where we're lucky there's some, some really interesting methodologies around for crop forecasting at the moment. Uh, and we're doing some work with the University of New England and because we have a really deep data set on uh, historical yields and fruit size, we're able to, to make the most of that and we're able to now plug that in and start to do some really good things. So we're being able to meet halfway. We're collecting our data in the right form and we can plug it in and it's meaningful. The environment. So, you know, this is probably one of the first places where I want just to, to stop for a minute and think about what are we doing to remove, and you'll probably get a flavour as I talk here, what, obviously the, the elephant in the room is harvest and so my mind is always coming back to that topic, but this applies for several different things. Assessing the crop, counting for yield. We've got to remove variability. You've got to think about all those things that at the moment technology companies are trying to do because we haven't overcome them. They're trying to control light, put a box over, actively illuminate, come in from the other side, use all this discretion because of the variability that exists in our system. And from what I can see, we're doing, in a lot of cases, you know, we're only making small inroads into actually getting closer to this really big problem as we, as we call it out. Um, evening out maturity, when you think about harvest, the more it's consistent, the easier it is to come through and, and take discretion out of selection of fruit, etc. So I'll keep moving through, but think about it in that tangent. You know, varieties, I think um, we, we need to be looking a fair way out the front window. I mean, anything that, if we're thinking less than 10 years, we're probably still a little bit blinkered here. What does a piece of fruit need to look like for a, a robot to harvest? You know, and I was interested today to hear uh, the guy from Crew Robotics talking about the fact that really we need to think about um, maybe varieties or growing plants that present differently and hit, that's him pleading back to us, could you start to change what you're doing so I can actually get to market quicker so I can solve your problem quicker. Um, you know, I look at what you guys do, you grow on tabletops, uh, I don't know what you call them up on tables, gutters, troughs, what's the word Jase? Tabletops, thanks Jase. Um, and whenever I see strawberries I think, I wonder if the industry is doing anything just to make that, make that stem just, just that much longer. If you can just get it all down and present the fruit, gosh, you go a long way to solving problems for um, scouting, for maturity, for um, presenting the fruit, for vision systems and for counting and for forecasting and for, like, it goes on and on and a lot of things come back. So what, what can we do in the variety space? Um, how important will firmness come? Will we do what the you know, the cherry industry is essentially trying to sell in the US is that we're going to go and sort of shake and catch, but they're still fresh cherries, they're not processed, and it doesn't matter they don't have a stem. Now, for me, a cherry without a stem is a plum. So I, I don't agree with that, but, um, you know, Matt Whiting's doing a fantastic job at saying we can maintain the integrity of the fruit and the quality such that it is a fresh market, but we've found a way to solve our labour problem. Who knows, will you end up there? Um, and will you be looking into stem pull force and the way that the fruit attaches and is there something around that going forward and is that how we'll overcome some of our challenges? Um, you can't have a discussion about technology and, and meeting technology halfway without connectivity and unfortunately, as starchy a topic as it is, all roads tend to lead there, whether it's, um, you know, over-the-air updates. So flashing software over-the-air now is, is a common thing, so it's this ability to do support and maintenance of technology remotely. So we've got this tyranny of distance in Australia. A lot of places we grow are quite remote. When something goes down and it's technology enabled, 
what does tier one support look like and how much of that is going to be able to be overcome over the phone as opposed to what we can now do quite intelligently over the air, if you will. Um, machine to machine communication. You know, you've got uh, gas automated sprayers out there now, you've got GoTrack with their um, fully automated tractor kits, you've got Monarch tractors with the electric self driving tractor, you've got blue white robotics doing a kit. This stuff's coming out everywhere, but it all requires connectivity. Autonomy needs supervision and it needs somebody sitting there with a tablet supervising a fleet and it comes back to connectivity. That's something we can take. And there's no real excuses now. Some really, there's still a couple of excuses and there's exceptions, but there's some really fantastic solutions in that space. Ah, this is my hobby horse, this one. Um, can I get another hour on this one? Plant architecture, like, I think if we were solving the harvest problem and you did it as a, like a design thinking exercise and just took all the blinkers off and gave it real critical thinking, I don't think we would grow the way we grow um, because I still don't think we're, as I say, meeting halfway and going close enough to solving. So, you know, we want these simple, narrow, accessible, productive canopies and that's this snap canopy thing and it doesn't matter which crop we're in, that's what we're all aiming for and it's all about presenting the fruit in a meaningful way. I'm going to digress for a second because it's just come into my mind. The beauty of becoming technology ready is even if the robots don't march into town is you're a better business for it. You're more productive, you will have better pack outs, you will be safer, you will be all of those things. So there's a good incentive to be heading down this pathway anyway. Um, and think about your production system and your architecture. What is it currently optimised for? Is it optimised for yield? In a lot of cases it is. Is it optimised? That's sort of the journey we first went on. It was like, can we crank these yields up? And then it was, oh, hang on, pack out. You're coming for the ride with us as well. So quality had to come. And so then we sort of tweaked again. Will we get to a point where we'll actually optimise for accessibility via you know, augmented technology and harvest platforms and, and robotics? And it was interesting, again, the crew, robotics guy, the crew, Harvest crew? Harvest crew? What are they called? Close, something like that. He was saying today that right then he's like, oh, actually, it'd be kind of good if you actually went back to the lower planting density for us. That'd be really good. And I was like, instantly, they were just stuck with me. I'm like, so maybe are we growing for more berries per plant, but less plants? And what does that look like? What's the dynamic there in the, in the plant architecture? Um, and it's about removing some of that discretion, which is just um, incredibly hard for tech companies to deal with. People. Um, you know, the biggest challenge I find within in the cost of business when I'm looking at technology is that even when we might get close to saying, this is the one, this is where we've got to go, there's this integration piece. And it's actually where most businesses fall over with their technology is actually embedding it and integrating it into your business. And this whole, what can we do to make tech better halfway, I think is about building capability in house. So it's, it's kind of, it's a different language now. Um, it's not native to a lot of people, this type of discussion with technology. Um, and, and so the more we can do to slowly just build the conversation and build that capability in-house for when things come, I think that um, it softens the landing for when the tech comes in. Um, you've got to get a bit more comfortable with ambiguity. You know, life isn't black and white, it's grey, and this stuff's never perfect and it's never going to do everything we think. But get comfortable in that grey area, and I think with some critical thinking we can really, really do some good things. Um, this is sort of a segue to that. Two-way engagement. So if you want to be part and you want the solutions to come to you quicker, start working with the solution providers. You know, articulate the unmet needs that you have and that you need to solve for. Um, force them to understand why it's important to you and which part you need to solve for. And equally, I think there's then a mutual acceptance of where the limitations are and what we're trying to do, and then I think we'll, we'll move quicker. And that's where this sort of co-creation of solutions really is born out of as opposed to sitting and waiting, and then it, you know, it arrives and someone says, oh, it's getting expensive to drive a tractor. Any kits out there? And I look to the shelf and I go, there's those two, but oh, they're no good to us for these reasons. And I think, well, if we see that out the front window, start talking to those companies, start engaging, start turning up to things, start understanding how, um, what their trajectory looks like, and maybe you can actually have an influence on it. Um, no surprises. Uh, none of these things will go anywhere if we don't invest in them. So if they are as important to us as we think they are, this is a relative comment, but we must, we must invest in them. Um, I'm just going to quickly show this before I roll in onto the last slide. So, you, you know, we talk about all those things that I think we can continue, it's a continuous business improvement kind of theme, but like look at the tech and look what these guys have to do 
to meet a still very traditional, I'm going to call it a flat bed, slightly angled bed, in ground system. But we've said, that's how we grow. Work out how to pick it. You've got millions and millions of dollars worth of R&D in the vision system because if you can't see fruit, you can't find fruit. So it's like, I've got to get down, get in, look around, come up the back, come over and then do that. We're asking it to be like a human hand, which is incredibly difficult to replicate. Um, we've got, you know, this end effector here. Um, you know, hardware companies spend years trying to work out. So should we optimise the human hand? Should we suck it? Should we use vacuum? Should we twist it? Should we snap it? Because we're all trying to just fill this gap. They've got uh, GPS and they've got LiDAR and they've got you name it. And then they're like, shit, we're outside. This is no good. Um, right, make it like a factory. Build this thing over the top. Um, control the light. Illuminate it from here. Shine it with this light. So, and we're just sitting back going, it's not bad, but you know, do you do one in blue or do you, um, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, no, no, keep in touch. No, we're interested to see how you go. And God, I drive you crazy if you're these guys. Like, it's exciting, but I still wonder what we're doing to help them out. So, take home messages. Um, yeah, be comfortable in that grey area. You know, I think that's half the problem is we're really looking for, you know, see problem, fix problem, and if it's not perfect, no, 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 I've looked at that company. No, then they're not quite getting there. Be patient. Um, reframe what you think's possible. Um, I'm amazed with what, what can be done now. And it's sort of, we all have our own limitations on if, you know, what you don't know is what you don't know. But um, surround yourself. If you, and if you need to bring other people into the group to change the way you think and facilitate that thinking, I would encourage you to do it. Um, and expand those time horizons. Um, and I say it with the utmost respect, um, but it's often challenging when I say, oh, you know, think 10 or 15 years out, oh, Jesus, I'm oh, bloody, I hope I'm done by then, I hope someone, oh, sold, I'll be sold up by then, and rah, rah, rah. We, we've got a pretty mature industry, and um, it's often hard to think like that, but if you're a believer in uh, the prosperity of the broader industry, then I would encourage you to still encourage those around you to think like that, even if you think you're not going to participate. And ultimately, this is a move from conventional towards analytical, whether we, whether we like it or not. So, yeah, to meet this challenge, halfway, we've got to pair this critical thinking with the emerging tech, I firmly believe, and we will be much, much closer to um, producing high-quality fruit with high market desirability. Thanks very much.